Let's turn to the scriptures, please. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. We want to speak this evening on the title, Secure in Christ. Secure in Christ. We had a meeting here not a week ago on a Saturday evening and brought a short word at the end of Simple Faith Singing. And an 84-year-old man came to me. And he says, I don't know if I'm saved. You know what the problem was? The man was saved after we talked for some time at length. He had just no assurance of his salvation in Christ. He had no assurance that he was Christ at 84 years of age. He got saved three years ago. See, you're never too old to be saved. You're never too young to be saved. You're never too old to be saved. But you can be too late to be saved. And this man wasn't sure about his salvation. And after speaking to him, he walked out lighter in spirit because he realized that he was saved by sovereign grace. So let's look at this this evening. You might say it's a, a, it's a strange way to bring this out, but let's just look at it as the Lord has shown us it. Isaiah 32, verse 1 and 2, just we'll read, but keep your Bible open. Everyone hear me okay, yes? Everyone here okay, yes? Okay. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And the man shall be as in hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Let's pray. Father, take your word. We ask you, Lord, that you would wing your own inspired, infallible word, to the hearts, Lord, even at the reading of it, two short verses, Lord, is enough to satiate the soul and to satisfy the heart. We ask you, Father, that you would speak to all of us, and if there's one or some who do not know your Son yet as their own Lord and personal Savior, we have never come to saving faith at the cross of Calvary. We ask you, O God, that you would speak to them this evening, that they may find a resting place at the cross. Father, we ask you, in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, Lord, that you would send forth thy Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, tonight. Send forth your Spirit, Lord, to those of us who are saved and blood-washed, who have come to saving faith in him, we pray, you would give us assurance of security in Christ and that you would give us, Lord, the knowledge, the freshness of Calvary, the freshness of the sacrifice of your dearly beloved on that cruel and rugged tree. Give us, Lord, the assurance of salvation. Let it be deep within our hearts and within our breasts. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth. And, O oh God, or this night be over, we pray that there won't be one that would leave here who has not met with the Lord, who has not had a Christ encounter. And, oh God, we pray you'd hide me and let him alone be seen, for he alone is worthy, and he alone deserves the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First, one says... Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And notice here the king that some think this king in Isaiah's day here at this point is none other than Hezekiah, the king of Judah, the southern king of the southern city in Jerusalem. Now bear with me for a moment because the next verse says, And a man shall be as in hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. So let's look at this for a moment. Is this Hezekiah, or speaketh it of another? Hezekiah, the king of Judah, while he was said to be a good king, uh, he was a godly king. He was a reformer tearing down the idols in Judah and, of course, opening the temple and all of its splendor again. Even the king's house was decked with gold. 
We find here that all of this glory was done for the Lord. So he was a good king. Second Kings chapter 18 and verse 4 tells us about him. And it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, or in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that David his father did. Now, David his father is not his father one generation back. It's many generations back. It's just the way they called it. But here he still could not fulfill all the things that are said of this man in verse 2. This king, although he was good, although he lived a life before God, although he even walked to try his best, how can a man be in hiding place? How can a man be a covert? How can a man be as rivers of water? How can a man be a shadow of a great rock in a weary land? Some commentators do point this to Hezekiah. I beg to differ. Remember, Hezekiah, for all his good points, for all his strengths and for all his abilities, was a sinner. Hezekiah was a just man before God, walking his best before God, but yet failing before God. Hezekiah, at the end of the day, he was a good man, but the best of men are men at their best. He cut the gold off the temple doors and from the pillars and he gave it to the Assyrian king who came to sack Jerusalem. He gave the silver that was found in the house of the Lord also and from the king's house. Hezekiah was trying to hide himself from Sennacherib, the Assyrian king who would come. And Hezekiah, he is the one who gave over the riches of the temple. Hezekiah found out that he was in need himself of a hiding place. Hezekiah found out that he was in need himself of a hiding place. So here we have this man cannot fulfill verse 2 of Isaiah 32. In 2 Kings chapter 20, it was Hezekiah who was sick. And it tells us he was sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet comes and says to him, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And it was Hezekiah with a death penalty upon him in sickness who turns his face to the wall and cries unto God and tells the Lord all the wonderful things that he had done for God and his kingdom and for his people. Such religion friend, does not seal. This proves to you, no matter how good you are, no matter how great of things you accomplish, none of it can save your soul at the end of the day. And none of it can rescue you when it comes to standing before God in eternity. He lies with his face toward the wall, and he cries unto God. He's looking for a hiding place. Oh God, have mercy on me. What a cry. It's good to have men and women who will humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. Good to have men and women who are unafraid and unashamed to say, Here am I, Lord. I'm a sinner before you. And you are the only Savior that can save my soul. Hezekiah wept sore. In 1 Kings 20 and verse 3, he wept like a baby because of his illness. God sends Isaiah the prophet back into Hezekiah the king, tells him to make a poultice and to get his servants to put a poultice upon it. When he does it, the Lord gives him 15 years, adds it to his life. Now listen, let me just sidetrack for a moment. There's a lesson in that for all of us. The Lord has given people the ability to make medicine like a poultice to help you get through your sickness. Don't be afraid to take it. I'm a Pentecostal and I believe in healing. I've seen it, but don't be afraid. The Lord can use these things. Listen. Isaiah 32, verses 1 and 2, doesn't speak of Hezekiah, although to some degree he seems to be a type of 
or a foreshadowing of, but he falls far short when we look at whom this is really, truly speaking about. Hezekiah was a man touched by God. But I say these verses prophetically speak, looking forward 750 years ahead of time or more. This speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, not a man touched by God, but God who is clothed in a man. Christ is God who was clothed with a man. A man shall be as in hiding place, says the prophet. The word here for man or aman is the word ish or ishi. It's used for the word man 1,002 times in the Old Testament. It's used for the word men 210 times. It's used 188 times for the word one, O-N-E. Strange, isn't it? It's used 69 times for husband. For husband. It's used 27 times for the word any, A-N-Y, and 143 times for miscellaneous use throughout the Old Testament. Now notice this. The word husband 69 times, ish or ishe, is used here for man. In the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, Hosea speaks of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And there, Israel are married unto God. And the ten tribe northern kingdom in the north have now fallen foul of God because of their sin. Listen to what God says through the prophet to them. Listen, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife. Neither am I her husband. Neither am I her mom. Neither am I her ishe. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her dress. I notice this. It means from the heart of her, from the heart of the northern kingdom. Hosea was the prophet of the north. And the Lord says, tell them I'm no longer married to them because of their spiritual idolatry, their sin, and their spiritual adultery with me. I am no longer their husband or their Ishai. Now, in Isaiah 32 and verse 2, a man shall be as in hiding place. 1,002 times, as I said, it's used for the actual word flesh and blood man. So a man who's flesh and blood, flesh, blood, and bone and sinew, a man will be as in hiding place. How come this will be, Lord? He's going to be a king who will reign in righteousness, and he's going to be a man who will make a covenant bond with his people. A man who will become their, listen, their Ishai, their husband. Hezekiah does not fulfill this, but Christ himself has come that he may call a bride unto himself. He is none other than our Ishai. He is our husband who is coming at the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice this. Notice this. In Isaiah 32 and verse 2, And a man shall be as in hiding place from the wind. And the idea here is that Christ is our hiding place. It's the Machabeh. And it means he is our refuge. Somewhere where you can hide, yet still peep out. That's the idea of it. I love it when Moses comes to Yahweh and says, show me your glory. And the Lord says, Moses, if I show you my glory, I'll consume you with my glory. Listen to what he says. But there is a place by me. There is a place by me. And when I pass, I'll cover you in the cleft of the rock with my hand, and you'll see my back parts, for you cannot see me and live. Yet, brothers and sisters, here we find that the one who came as a man, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the one who bore our sin in his own body on the tree and died for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
we find not only is he our Ishai, he is our Redeemer, but he says there is a place by me. We can see the glory of the invisible God in the face of Jesus Christ. We can see the glory of the invisible God because he is the expression of the invisible God. And he is the one who hung on the cross of Calvary. Don't be mistaken by thinking he's just a man, nor is he just a prophet. Don't be mistaken by thinking he's just some spiritual guru or some great rebel leader. No, Christ is God, a very God, in the flesh, manifest for you and I. And in great love, he hangs on the cross and he bleeds and he dies in our room instead. Know what he says to the sinner tonight? Here, before you see my glory and you're not saved and you are destroyed, he says, here there is a place by me. There's plenty of room at the foot of the cross for the repentant sinner. There's still power in the blood of the Lamb. He says here, a man shall be as in hiding place, a refuge or a lurking place. Let me look at this for a few moments. And write it down. You can read it when you go home. In Genesis chapter 3 is the story of Adam and Eve sinning in the garden. And we're told that they hide themselves. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 says they take fig leaves to make aprons to cover themselves. You see, that garment of light or that garment of innocence, of their nakedness, had now become known unto them and they were ashamed. And now they hide. They try to cover their sin. They try to sew aprons together with fig leaves and put it upon themselves that, well, no one will know. And that's what fig tree religion does for you. And that carried right down through the years. Even through Judah, the fig tree represents the Jews where it was all temple worship. When Christ came, God in flesh, they rejected him. Because salvation is by grace through faith. With temple, the temple, the temple, they cry. And Christ says, no, there's one greater than the temple is here. God himself manifest in the flesh. The Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. Notice this. They cover themselves with aprons in verse 7 of Genesis 3. And then in verse 8, they hide themselves. It's the same word. It's kavah. That's the root word. For a man shall be as in hiding place. And so they are hiding themselves among the trees, as it were. Well, they're trying to dodge. They hear the voice of God coming. Adam, where art thou? Well, Lord, we heard your voice in the garden and we were afraid and we hid ourselves because we were naked. And the Lord says to them, Who told you you were naked? See, the difference was here. The difference was not only did they realize they were naked, they realized they were wrong before God. Conviction of sin for the first time in the Word of God. That's the first time you'll read of their conviction of sin. Friend, if there's conviction of sin in your life, you can't hide from God. You cannot cover your own sin with religion or denomination. You can't cover it by saying you're a Catholic or a Protestant or whoever else. You cannot cover your sin. It's only the blood of the Lamb that will cover you from your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here, they try to cover themselves and then they hide themselves, peering out, as it were, from between the trees. The only covering is the blood of the only hiding place is the man of Isaiah 32 and verse 2. The primitive root for this word hiding, it gives the idea to fervently cherish. To fervently cherish or to fervently love. Now listen, let's catch this because 
People think, well, I'm just going to get saved and we sing I'm hiding in Christ and we're talk about all of these wonderful things. Let me just read one verse out to you if I can remember where it is because I'm doing it off the top of my head. Notice this. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, there's one little verse that uses the primitive root to give us an idea of exactly what God is saying here. Listen to what it says. Deuteronomy 33, on verse 3, Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet, every one shall receive of thy words. This reminds me of Mary, that young woman who sat at the feet of Christ. The school of Mary, as it's called, while Martha was cumbered about with much serving. But notice, let me read it again, Deuteronomy 33 and 3. Yea, he loved the people. The idea for loved here is the word. He hides them in his love. He loves me so much. Imagine that. He loves you so much. He hides you deep in his heart when you're in his son. For someone that isn't saved, they don't understand what the love of God is. And there are those who are struggling in their faith. You know why? Because you do not fully comprehend or understand God's love for you. Why would God love me? How could God love me? Friend, I ask it all the time. But this I know. He loves me. He loves you. The word loved here, yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. Here is the root word for hiding place gives the idea to fervently cherish, to fervently love, listen, to hide in one's bosom. To hide in one's bosom. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 1 and verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. You know what Jesus is saying? Father loves me so much, he says, I am the very heart of God. Now listen to what Paul tells you if you're saved. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul tells us of those who are in Christ, who have repented and trusted in him and his finished work on the cross. Listen, he says, your life is hid with Christ. In God. How secure are you in your salvation? Listen, I have something to tell you. People may turn around and disagree with me and say, are you saved? My salvation doesn't rest on him. And my salvation doesn't rest on her. My salvation rests on him. And he loves us so much, he gave his own life for us. He poured out his soul unto death on the cross of Calvary. He shed his precious blood. He loves you. He loves you. And your life is hid. Your life is hid with Christ in God. A man shall be as an hiding place from the wind. Can I ask you? Are you saved? Are you saved? Is your life hid with Christ and God? Let me tell you how secure Christ makes those who are his. He seals them with the Holy Ghost. In other words, he puts that stamp upon you and he says, they're mine. And you cannot open this letter of love of mine until it reaches its destination. Where's the destination? The kingdom of God. Heaven itself. Saved. Sealed. Secured. And we're satisfied with all that he has done for us. Here we find that 
the man that shall be in hiding place from the wind, or it means from the, the blast, he stands in to cover. He stands in to cover. Oh God, you've covered me many times. He's covered me many times. Thank you, Jesus. Secondly, he's a covert from the tempest. Now, this is similar to hiding place, but listen, it's a covert. It's the word sather or sithra. Let me give you an idea of what it means. It means a secret place, hiding place and a secret place. There's a, a, a place in, near Carrick Fergus called Sithra Organization, and they take... Uh, battered wives and, uh, and women who have had a, a, a terrible time with their husbands and they, and they shelter them in a place and they bring them in where none can get them and they look after them and they pray with them and they help them. I know the, Alison and I know the ladies well who, who run it. I've known them for years. And they, get, they call it Sitra. It comes from this idea that it's a, a secret place. Bring them out of the road completely from it and to be very familiar with them, that they can minister unto them, that they can be close to them. Now with that in mind, Christ is the covert from the tempest. Oh, the wind has got up, but now the tempest comes. Notice the storm that's getting stronger. And Christ says, come further in. Come deeper. Psalm 32 and verse 7 Thou art mine hiding place, saith the psalmist. The word hiding place is the word sithra, or sather. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. To think that when you and I are children of God, that we are born again of the Spirit. We're washed in the blood. We're sealed by the Holy Ghost. We belong to Christ for time and for eternity. For we have yielded our all to Him who has given His life for us on the cross. To think that when all things are going wrong, He says, come, there's a place by me. Now I come further into the secret place with me. I'll sing over you. Whenever our Lord, the night he was betrayed to be arrested and then crucified, it says, and when they had sung on him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And the hymn that is believed to be sung is known as the Great Hallel. That's why when you say Hallelujah, understand what you're saying. It's Hallel, you Yah, praise of God. That's what it means. Yah is God, Yahweh. Jehovah. And the Hallel was Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And think about it. Christ sang it all, probably off by heart, in the upper room with those whom he loved and loved him, and as they worshipped. You know what one of the verses are that he sang? He's going to face a beating. He's going to face the cross. The pain, the shame, the suffering, the agony, the torment. He's going to give his life. You know one of the verses of it is? This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? He's going to be mutilated. Mutilated. Face marred more than any man. His back like a ploughed field with the whip of the Roman scourge. Nailed hand and foot to a cross. Crown of thorns driven into his brow. Beaten and battered and bruised for you and me. And yet before it he's worshipping. He says, Father, this is the day that you've made. Oh boy. Sometimes we come in and, and I'm guilty too. And we come in and someone goes, I've heard people before, ah, it's raining out, our shirt's cold, and someone feeling more spiritual at that moment goes, this is the day that the Lord hath made. <laughs> My word, that is not what it means. Christ sang it. This is the day. Calvary! This is it. It was ordained by the Father. 
an eternity past. It wasn't a, an afterthought. Calvary wasn't a plan B after the first covenant. Didn't seem to work because Israel had sinned so much. Calvary, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, it was as good as done. Here, we find that the word here, thou compass me about with songs of deliverance. <laughs> It says, come closer in. It means to hide in. A secret place. Come deeper. Listen to the words of William Orcutt Cushing. One of his other famous, if you want, hymns that he had written was Follow On or Follow, Follow. Glasgow Rangers took it and Follow, Follow, We Will Follow Rangers. It's follow, follow, we will follow Jesus. Listen to what he says in one of his verses of another hymn. How oft in the conflict, when pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when trials like sea billows roll, have I hidden in thee, O thy rock of my soul. Isn't that beautiful? I'm hiding in thee. I'm hiding in thee, thy blessed rock of ages. I'm hiding in thee. That's what he had written. Obviously, it is a man who has had a walk with Christ and found there alone is his salvation and his security. Friend, there's nothing as secure. There's nothing that has security but Christ alone. If you're trusting in anyone or anything else, it's a false sense of security. But security is in Jesus only. Christ alone. This man is our hiding place. He is a covered from the tempest also. Psalm 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place. That's the Sather. He that spends time in his presence <laughs> hides in him. Brother, sister, when was the last time you went on your own and just said, Lord, I'm hiding in thee? Just you and me, Lord, and none other. Don't even bring your wife. Don't bring your husband. Just you and the Lord. He is a covert from the tempest. The word tempest is a covert from the storm. Or he is a covert from the flood. It's the idea that when the flood comes... When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The flood here, listen to what Jesus says, speaking of Noah's day and the great flood that God sent to judge the world because of their sin. Listen to what he says in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39. Jesus says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is speaking of the flood, where Noah built the ark and eight souls were saved, because they were in the ark. He says, the world will be similar to that flood, when I return. But friends, he's not coming to flood the world. The bow in the sky is not gay pride. The bow in the sky is a covenant promise of God. Even the word pride flies in the face of God. He's coming with fire. He 
that's coming with fire. He says the word will be the same. What was it like in the days of Noah? Well, there was all sorts of fornication going on, and there was liberalism to the extreme, right-wing liberalism, as it were. Everything and anything goes. There was nothing that was withheld by them. All, everything went. The same in Noah's day. There was sin on the left hand, and there was sin on the right, and all the marriages were coming together, and then they were marrying all the foreigners that were, that, that were all uh, married on the other gods and bringing away God's people. Sin came in, destroyed mankind. God says, I've had enough. Violence filled the earth. Look at the violence in our earth. Look at the violence that's all around our world. Look at the violence that's coming to our nation, to the British Isles. The violence from Southern Ireland to the north of Ireland, from Northern Ireland, from London to London Derry. Look at the violence. Look at the violence in Europe. The violence in Africa. It's everywhere. Across the states. Look at the sin of man. How much longer can we go on? How much longer can the earth last? Even the scriptures tell us that the earth is travailing and groaning like a woman who's having contractions about to give birth. And what is it we're looking for? The manifestations of the sons of God. You know what the manifestation is? Christ coming in the resurrection of the dead. The earth's going, I can't cope anymore. The very planet is groaning and in travail, looking for Christ to come again. Yet mankind, God's crowning glory of creation, Adam's race, he runs about like a beast and wants not to know the things of God. Jesus says, just like that flood, you know who's going to survive it? Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Man shall be as in hiding place. A man shall be a covert. Thirdly, a man shall be rivers of water in a dry place. Now, initially, I would think, being a Pentecostal, that rivers of water in a dry place would be, he is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And he is. I don't believe that's what he means. You see, what I think it means is, Christ is the satisfier of the soul. Christ is the satisfier of the soul. Do you know why the world is the way it is? Because they're looking for something. Because they're trying to fill a void. You know, Spurgeon says there's a God-shaped vacuum in every heart and only he can fill it. Well, maybe there's a God-shaped vacuum in someone's heart and you've tried and tried other things, but ah, uh, you see, it just didn't work. Christ is the rivers of water in a dry place. Listen to what Jeremiah says in two, Jeremiah 2 and 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The cisterns were, they were dug into the earth looking for wells of water. That was their cistern of water. It's like the whole hymn writer wrote, I've tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Then as I stooped to drink, they fled and mocked me as I willed. Now none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus, found in thee. Friend, Christ is the rivers of living water in a dry place. And yet in John chapter 19 and verse 28, the man who is the hiding place and the covert 
The man in John 19 and 20 hanging on a cross, the one who speaks to Jeremiah and says, my people have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, now in flesh hangs on the cross. And he says two words, I thirst. I cannot be. The fountain of all living waters now hangs and bleeding, dying in agony says, I thirst. I'm thirsty. The Savior is saying, I'm thirsty. But you're God. Let us remember the dual nature of Christ. Let us remember He is fully divine. He is fully divine. He is the Spirit of God. And yet He is fully human. He is a man of flesh and blood like you are and I. And he's thirsty. Listen to Psalm 22, verses 15 and 16. And this is known as the Psalm of the Cross. 1,000 years before Calvary. Listen, Psalm 22, verses 13, 15 and 16. My strength has dried up like a pot shared. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. A thousand years before Calvary. Who told the prophet to say that? Jesus. He says, they're my hands. Listen, this isn't someone else. This isn't him guessing a thousand years. Jesus himself, pre-Bethlehem, he comes and he says, they'll pierce my hands. They'll pierce my feet. For dogs, he says, have encompassed me. Who's the dogs? The Roman soldiers were called it. The assembly of the wicked half enclosed me. Who's the assembly of the wicked? The Jewish Pharisees. They pierced my hands and my feet. Even before crucifixion by the piercing of the feet was ever known. <laughs> he took my place in Calvary. He took yours. We must hide in him. We must come into the secret, covert place with him. And he will satisfy us with rivers of living water. Fourthly, finally, he is the shadow of a great rock and a weary land. He is the shadow of a great rock and a weary land. Now, there's two things I want to look at. There's many others, but there's two main ones we want to look at just briefly about a shadow. Okay? The word shadow, the shadow of a great rock, it's the word seal. Seal. And it means a shade of defense. Christ is the shade of defense. Let's read Psalm 91 and verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place, the sithra of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow, the seal, the Shade of defense, the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 121 and verse 5, The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is the shade on thy right hand. It's, he is the seal of thy right hand. He is your shade of defense. So you see, you can get a shadow that defends you, that covers you. I'll give you an example. Many times is it when you're on holiday and you're a nice, lovely, sunny day, and maybe you've went to Florida or somewhere like that. I know some have went recently to Florida and it was nice and sunny. And said it was too warm, but and there is a lovely uh, tree that you can go and you can go under the shade of it, and it defends you from the sunburn and it defends you from that heat. It seems to drop the temperature a little just because it's a shade. It's the idea, as the Lord says, I will be your covering. 
when the heat of the day is on you, I will shade you. The idea here also for shadow, let me show you this one. In Psalm 23 and verse 4, we will all know it well. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, the, word, the term shadow of death here is a seal for shadow of death. is a seal of my way. That's the way it reads. Yea, though I walk through the, the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the seal of my way. That which is looming. That which is covering. That which is hovering over me. That shadow of our enemy, which is called death. See the difference? See the difference? Now listen to what he says. It's as though he's speaking to the crowd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why, David? Why? He speaks to God then. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you see when it comes to the time when you close your eyes in the sleep of death? Do you see the time you take your last breath? Do you know what you need? You're going to go into that shadow which will loom over every single one of us through Christ, Harry. You know what you need? To be found hiding in Christ and say, Thou art with me. Only the saved can say that. Only the saved, the saved have that. Job asked God, or God asked Job, pardon me. Listen to what he says. Job 38 and verse 17. He says, Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? <laughs> Listen, Job. I know you've lost a lot. You've lost your family and I know that you've lost your house and I know you've lost your prestige and your standing in society and I know you've lost all of those things. Your very health is bad. I know you've lost it all, God says. And then he comes to him and he says, has the gates of death been opened unto thee? Well, no, Lord, you've preserved me. You've preserved me. Or has the doors of the shadow of death? Have you seen them? Have I allowed the devil to take you, Job? He says, no, Lord, you've preserved me. Why? Because, Job, you're hiding in me. You're hiding in me. And do you see when the very gates of death swing wide open for all of us through Christ's tarry? And do you see when we see for the first time the doors of the shadow of death. Fear can grip the heart. But God says, no. He says, because I will be with you. He says, you'll hide in me. Is Christ your hiding place? Is Christ your hiding place? Psalm 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock. Shut of a great rock. The Lord is my rock. My fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom will I trust? My buckler, the horn of my salvation on my high tower. See the word salvation, Psalm 18 and verse 2. Underline it. Right underneath it, Yasha. Y-E-S-H-A for English rendering. Yasha. Do you know what it is? Do you ever hear of the Lord Jesus being called Yahshua, HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah? The word Yahshua is salvation. You know who Christ is? He is the Yahshua. Let's put it into English here. And whom will I trust? My buckler, the horn of my salvation, or this horn means the strength. And my strength is in Jesus, as the way it reads. My high tar. He's my high tower. Jesus said, upon this rock, the revelation of who he is, Almighty God, he is the Son of the Father. He is the one who bled and died on Calvary's tree. He says, upon this rock, Peter, 
Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says. And the Lord says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades or death shall not prevail against it. 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, we're told that all did drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. That rock followed them, and that rock was Christ. He is the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. So I finish with this. Thank you for your attention. It's been wonderful. Isaiah 32 and 2. A man shall be as in hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. <laughs> Yet in John chapter 19. The more I think about it, and the more I've written it, and I've studied it, and went over it, and wrote it, the more it amazes me. John 19, Jesus is being tried. And Pilate has beaten him. He's had him whipped, or pardon me, he's had him beaten him with staves, with their hands, his clothes taken off him, stripped naked. They've pulled out his beard, they've spat upon him. And Pilate brings Christ out to a baying mob. The idea isn't that there's a few people saying, crucify him, crucify him. You know what the idea is? There's a mob that's now lusting for his blood. The mob are actually saying, if you don't crucify him, listen, let me put it into ordinary language. We will wreck this place. That's the way it reads in the original. It's like you would see somewhere where they're having some big, uh, some big, town or city, that, and they're, they're having a rally, and they, they go into violence. That's the idea of it, and they're saying, crucify him. And here, Pilate brings out a bloodied Christ. And this is what he says, behold the man. What man? What man? Yes, he's a man. Aye, but this is God's son. And you're about to have him nailed to a tree. Your sin did it. So did mine. Behold the man. This is the way it reads in the original because I'm going to do it with the, show you this and then finish. It means, behold means look, see, it's the word ide. It means be, look or see, it's a, an utterance of one who wishes that something should not be neglected by another. Now look ye here. Now let me tell you the way it would read in the original. When he brings him out, and the crowd are before him, and the Christ that has been beating, Jesus is there, a bloody pulp, a mess. Battered. Just behold the man. This is what it reads. You ready? It gives the idea of shock and surprise. He says, Behold the man! Look at him! That's where it goes. Look at him! Has he not had enough? Has he not went through enough? Look at his face! Look into his eyes! Look at his blood streaming from him. Look at the pain that he's in, the suffering and the shame, stripped naked. Behold the man! Heartlessly they go, he will not have this man to rule over us. Away with him. Crucify him. Crucify him. You see, when they say that, crucify him. Crucify him. They're saying, no, get rid of him completely. I'm going to tell you, you may say, how horrible. 
how detestable, how wicked, how cruel. And yet, there's people in our land doing it every single day of the week. We don't want this man. Get him out of our sight. 